Well, good evening, dear friends, and welcome to our 18th study. Can you believe that uh, six weeks have come and gone? Time sure does go in a hurry. I'd like to invite you to stand for the invocation so that we can begin our study for this evening. Our Father, which art in heaven, we're so thankful for your many and abundant blessings to us. And as we study this evening, we pray, asking for the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring us understanding, to bring it clear to our minds and to our hearts what the prophetic story has for us. Help us to see in these things more clearly all that's going to happen and what we will be facing so that we might be prepared, so that our faith in Jesus might be complete. These things we ask in his holy name. Amen. I'm very happy to see each one of you. I hope that I didn't scare you off in our last study. I want to do just a little bit of review, if I can, to begin to pick up some of the pieces so that we can uh, make some sense out of the rest of our study this evening. I'd like for you to look up here at the board, and I would like for you to just mentally recall a few things. We were talking about the seven seals and uh, how that uh, today might be represented by this little thin line between my two pads here. And the fourth seal is the next seal to open. And this fourth seal represents the full cup principle. When the fourth seal is opened, it's opened because the, the, four, the uh, full cup has been reached. And I believe that uh, at the end of 70 jubilees, the units of 70 we see consistently, we can expect around that time the opening of the fourth seal. And we'll see God's judgments unleashed. Sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. And we understand that the angels are holding back these four judgments of the fourth seal until the 144,000 are ready to go. Then when, when he opens up the fourth seal, the judgments commence and the events will transpire very rapidly and very quickly. And in fact, this entire time period from the opening of the fourth seal down to the time of the second coming is a maximum of 1,335 days. Actually, the reason I say it's a maximum is because Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, this time has been cut short or no one would live through it. The judgments and the things that happen are so severe. Well, we've synchronized the opening of the fourth seal with the sounding of the trumpets. Now, the event that marks the beginning of the trumpets is the throwing down of the censer in Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 through 5. And the throwing down of the censer indicates that God's corporate intercession, the daily, if you will, Jesus corporately interceding on behalf of the human race for everyone around him. He steps out of the way and the judgments of God are revealed. The asteroids, the meteorite showers, the volcanoes, and all the terrible things in the earth, the, cal the calamities beyond description occur casting and putting the world into a most ex extreme condition. And the question of survival will be on everybody's mind. Who needs a savior? A man who is lying on the beach in the sun or the man who is sinking in the water out in the gulf? Who, which one needs a life saver? Who needs the savior? God is allowing these judgments to come up on the world so that every human being can realize their need of the Savior. Jesus is not a Savior. He is the Savior. There is only one, and His name is Jesus. There is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. His name is Jesus. And the purpose of the trumpets is to arouse everyone to the realization of their need for a Savior. Jesus is not only the sacrifice for our sins, He is the priest that administers the blood 
And he's the high priest ultimately that cleanses the sanctuary in heaven for us so that the whole economy of sin can be dealt with. So the trumpets correspond with the seals, as you see here. The fifth trumpet represents the coming of Satan in person to take possession of the world and all that he can within it. And when he first comes, his first work is to deceive the earth into thinking that he's God Almighty. And after he has convinced people for some time, then he moves in the sixth trumpet. You see, God holds him back until the right day, hour, month, and year. God holds him back until it's, he's ready and he, God lets Lucifer go to conduct civil war upon the earth and to take control of the earth. His taking control of the earth is what the time period is for the establishing of the mark of the beast. I'm going to talk about the mark of the beast tonight. The mark of the beast will be established during the time period of the sixth trumpet. You'll see that more clearly tonight. The seventh trumpet represents the third and final woe upon mankind. And it's an announcement that mercy is closed and that the wrath of God without mercy is about to be poured out in the seven last plagues. So that's the scenario so far. And then we began studying in our study uh, Tuesday night the rev story of Revelation 12. And we started with the birth of Christ, how that Satan tried to kill Jesus at time of birth. He did finally kill Jesus on Calvary. He had led wicked men to do that. But Jesus resurrect, was resurrected. And he was taken up to the Father and to his throne. And I showed you how that on Sunday morning. You know, the reason Je Jesus told Mary Magdalene not to detain him. She found him there in the garden, remember? And he says, don't hold on to me. I've got to rush up to heaven. I've got some business to take care of. And don't detain me. He had to rush up there to throw Satan down once for all. And he did it. He finished Lucifer's arguments among all of heaven full and completely there that day. And he presented before the Father himself as an acceptable sacrifice. Then the dragon, when he saw that he'd been cast to the earth, the Bible says, he chased the woman. We know that this time period is 1260 years because we're dealing with the apocalyptic, excuse me, the Jubilee calendar. I have here a lovely picture of the woman. Isn't this much nicer than what I can draw? Thank you, Norman. Thank you. There she is. Now, in the scriptures, the Bible tells us that she's clothed with the sun and she stands on the moon and she has on her head a crown of 12 stars. I'd like to suggest to you that the moon is an object that she stands upon. It's the foundation of what the woman stands on. The moon has no light of itself. But if you'll look carefully in Psalm 89, you will notice that the moon symbolizes God's covenant. And his covenant is this. If you will be my people, I will be your God. This is the, this is the prima dogma. This is the foundational element of the woman's relationship to the lamb. Remember the marriage of the lamb at the end of Revelation 19? She stands on the moon, and the moon symbolizes the covenant. When you get married, the marriage is based on a covenant. If you will be my husband, I will be your wife, and vice versa. It's the covenant that keeps the relationship together, and so it is. The woman stands on, you know, of itself, the moon has no light. The covenant means nothing without the illumination of Christ's righteousness. The woman wears his righteousness. That's what the sun represents. And she wears his righteousness, and his righteousness brings his covenant into full view. I think that is so beautiful. His love makes the covenant eternal. The crown on her head is a Stephanos. 
as opposed to a diadema. There's two kinds of crowns in the Greek, and in the Bible, they're both translated just the word crown, but they're very different. The Stephanos crown is the kind of crown that an athlete wears for having won the race. It's the crown of victory, the one who has overcome, the one who has succeeded against all the odds. And the woman wears not a diadem. The diadem is a crown of rulership, a crown of authority, a crown that the kings wear. But she's not wearing those crowns. She's wearing a Stephanos, a crown of victory. And it's gold. And it's set with 12 stars. These stars represent the 12 tribes from which the 144,000 come. I'll explain that, I hope, in, as we can cover it later. But uh, I'm trying to give you a little larger understanding about the woman. This woman represents the people of God. And the devil chased them to the desert for 1260 years trying to destroy her. And he couldn't do it. He did everything possible. He burned the Christians, the, the, the true church, at the stake by the millions. Millions perished by the sword and starvation and sickness. But the blood of martyrs were, became fertilizer to the seed of, of the gospel. And baby Christians sprouted up everywhere. So as a last ditch effort, the devil cast out of his mouth a great flood a great war to destroy the woman and the great war finally convulsed in France during the what we call today the French Revolution perhaps the bloodiest and most horrible war ever fought for three and a half years Europe convulsed in an all-out terror this war Satan had tried to to destroy the woman with this war, but alas, the Bible says the earth opened its mouth and helped the woman, and God opened up a continent for those fleeing, a place to go for those who wanted religious freedom and religious liberty, and the United States of America was fulfilled that part of the prophecy. Then the Bible says the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went away to make war on the remnant of her offspring, or the last of her, of her people. So during the time period of 1798 to this very day, Satan has been preparing to make war on whom? The saints. And I want you to understand something. Get it very clear right in your head this evening. When these events begin, Satan will seize the opportunity to do what he's been wanting to do all along, and that is destroy God's people. Satan has 6,000 years of history of attempting to destroy God's people, and during the great destruction and the great confusion and the stupor that will overcome the world, he's going to move very quickly and very swiftly to accomplish what he wants done. If you were going to rob a bank, wouldn't it make sense to you that you, the best time you could do it is when the whole city is in an uproar over on the other side about something? Now, I know that you're not bank robbers. I know you don't dwell on these things, but just think about it for a moment. Wouldn't it be reasonable? Don't you think it would be a, a good, good timing that if the, if the south end of Dayton was burning and all the police were down there and all the fire trucks were down there and all the people were down there, it would be nice to run up to the north end of town and rob a bank? Wouldn't that be smart? I mean, if you were going to do that? That's precisely what the devil's going to do. When the whole world is coming apart at the seams, he's going to move in quickly for the ultimate purpose of making war on the saints. And you get this right here in Revelation 7. Now, tonight, I want to pick up on this beast that comes up. First of all, I need to show you my picture. Let me get the lady out of the way here and show you. This is the dragon. 
This is the serpent Satan. And you can see he has seven heads and he has ten horns. And you will notice that the crowns are on the horns. Excuse me, they're on the heads. Later they're on the horns. We'll, I get that confused when I'm not reading my Bible. So we have this red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, and the crowns are on the heads. And, that's, and so that would mean there would be seven crowns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now later, when we see this creature again, he has, he has dressed up a little bit. You remember me speaking to you about the Muppet, the hand puppet, and the hand within it? Well, I'd like to introduce you to what the glove looks like. Same beast, same power within it, same seven heads, but it's changed a little bit. You'll notice there are now ten crowns because there's a crown on each horn. Let me illustrate something. I, I brought a little uh, visual aid because I'm going to show you something that you'll never forget. This is my hand. Five long fingers. Big hand, too. And if I put my hand in this glove, still have a hand. I still have a hand here. But what I want to show you is that this beast has <laughs> seven heads. And we're going to learn tonight that five are fallen, and one is, and one is yet to come. Now, I told you you'd never forget this. <laughs> good, good. The idea here is to understand the relationship between the hand and the glove. Because that's precisely what we have here. The hand and the glove. Does that make sense? And the reason that it's done this way is that Satan can take different shapes and different forms. Someone asked me the other night, when I was explaining um, how that at the, when Jesus comes at the second coming, that, say, uh, that Jesus destroys the apparition that the devil is using in the lake of fire. And they said, well, how can, how can God destroy the apparition and not destroy the devil because the devil is put back into the abyss for a thousand years? And here's a simple explanation. It's the same problem with the snake in the Garden of Eden. When Jesus came down that evening after Adam and Eve had sinned, he stomped the head of that snake and killed it. The devil didn't die. The devil's still alive. He just used the, the serpent to accomplish his means. He will use a physical body to accomplish his means, but when the body's destroyed, he's not yet destroyed. He's not destroyed until the end of the thousand years. Does that make sense? When, when God spoke to Balaam through his donkey, remember? I'm sure the donkey died. But did God die? No. No. In other words, there is another realm that these beings, angels, can enter bodies of things and give them life or intelligence if they wish. And then they can leave them. It's sort of like what we say today in speaking of being demon-possessed and demons being cast out, but the person is still there. You understand what I'm trying to explain? What we have here is the master demon in his structure to accomplish his means. This beast will come up out of the water. Water representing multitudes, nations, languages, the whole world. 
This beast will form very rapidly and very quickly as a result of the destruction that comes through the trumpets. That's what gives this cause for the rise of this beast. And when this beast rises up out of the sea, the Bible says that one of the heads had been wounded, but what? The deadly wound is healed. Now, there are seven heads on this beast, and the purpose of this beast is to make war upon the saints. And I've got some very terrible news to tell you. The beast is going to win the war. A lot of people are mistaken on this point today. They see the church victorious. I believe the uh, tallies sing a wonderful song, the church triumphant, and everyone stands to their feet. It is a glorious song. It is a wonderful song. But I don't believe that most people understand what the triumph will be. It will not be as human beings count triumph. Let open your Bibles to Revelation 13. And I would like for you to look at verse 7 very carefully and notice what the Bible says. Speaking of this beast right here, having seven heads and ten horns, the Bible says he was given power to make war against the saints and to almost conquer them. Is that what it says? It says he was given power to conquer them. Conquer them. When Rome conquered Greece, what did that mean as far as Greece was concerned? The end. Hold your finger right here and flip back to Daniel chapter 12. And I want you to look at verse 7, the last sentence in verse 7. Daniel is looking down at the end of time, and he's wondering when all of this vision of Daniel 8 through 12 is to be fulfilled. And notice what the last sentence says. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. The point that I'm trying to get you to understand, dear friends, is that the saints are going to go down in this final conflict, and Satan is going to win. As far as the world is concerned, it will appear as though God's cause has been completely destroyed. And this is why ultimately we learn that there is a universal death decree. Millions of God's people are going to perish in the fifth seal. What is the fifth seal? Martyrdom. Millions millions upon millions will perish in the war that this beast is going to wage upon them. If you will notice very carefully, look at verse 5, Revelation 13, verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for how long? Forty-two months. How long is forty-two months? Twelve hundred and sixty days. Well, you should notice an interesting parallel. The saints, the remnant at the end of time, are going to experience the same persecution, the same destruction, the same warfare, and for twelve hundred and sixty days that the Christians have suffered for 1260 years. A day for a year. This 
42 months of persecution, dear friends, is after the deadly wound is healed. Do you see that? If you follow Revelation 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and look at the chronological development of this story, the 42 months have to happen after the beast rises up out of the water. And the beast rises up out of the water after Satan has gone away to prepare for war on the remnant, which is after the deadly wound has been inflicted. Donna, does that make sense? Do you see the progression and why this has to be before us? Let's read verses 5 again. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over whom? Everybody everywhere. That's what it says. Over every tribe, people, language, and nation. This beast is a universal power that will have complete global authority. And verse 8 says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, these things are before us, not behind us. And so many Christians hold one of two fatal ideas. Many Christians believe that the tribulation that's coming does not apply to them because they're going to be raptured away into heaven and will escape all of these things coming to pass upon the earth. But you know, there's another group of Christians who are just as bad. They believe that all of this has been fulfilled in the past and there's nothing to wait for but the second coming of Jesus. Both groups will be utterly surprised and overwhelmed with the things that are about to happen. The devil is very pleased to have you believe one or the other because they have the same effect. In both cases, you miss the tribulation do you see that? It's very clear that this is future. And it happens after the deadly wound has been healed. Now, we want to investigate these seven heads. Who are they and what do they represent? This is a very critical point in understanding how this thing comes together. Look at Revelation 13, 1 and tell me what is on each head. A blasphemous name. What does the word blasphemy mean? It means to take the prerogative of God. It means that you claim to have the authority of God. It claims that blasphemy means that you try, that you uh, represent God when in reality you don't. To blaspheme is to make God up, to create him for, your, for yourself. Each one of these seven heads have a blasphemous name on them, and that gives me two interesting clues. One, these heads are all religious because they speak on behalf of God incorrectly. Does that make sense? Number two, the fact that there are seven of them gives me a very interesting clue. Seven is a number of completion or fullness. And since this involves the whole world, I suspect that these seven heads represent seven religious systems, the seven religious systems of the world And I know who one of them is. Probably the larger one here in the middle, if you want to look at it this way. 
But I believe that the larger head is the church today that we call the Roman Catholic Church. This is the one that was wounded and was healed. And among the seven religious systems of the world, the Roman Catholic Church is the predominant and powerful church. It has diplomatic and political or at least uh, relations with the important nations of the world. Among all of the religious systems of the world, the papacy stands head and shoulders above the others in terms of political prowess. But wait a minute. If this is the papacy, there's got to be six others that are similar to it. Who are they? You see, all of these heads represent the same thing categorically. In other words, you can't say, well, this one here is the papacy and this one here is pagan Rome. In other words, if this is a religious organization, this one has to be a religious organization. The heads are heads. All of them have blasphemous names because all of them claim to speak for God and they're all false. They're all corrupt. And I'm going, I believe there's a very simple answer for all these seven heads if we will let the Bible speak for itself. And to do that, let's jump over to Revelation chapter 17. We want to notice something about this beast with seven heads and ten horns because in chapter 17, verse 3, I have another picture. I came loaded tonight with lots of pictures. We haven't studied the great whore that rides upon the beast having the seven heads and ten horns yet, but we'll, we'll get to her. I'm just trying to get you a, a mental picture right now so that you understand what we're talking about in Revelation 17. John wants to know about the beast. He wants to know about the woman. He wants to know about all these things. And so he's taken off into vision to see these things. But right now, we're just going to put this picture back aside so that we can focus on this guy. This is a little clearer picture. These seven heads and ten horns. He says, um, verse 1, one of the angels, seven angels, who had the seven bowls, that is the seven last plagues, came and said to me, come here, John, and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitutes who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. You say, what, kind, what does that mean? The inhabitants of the earth are intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries. Without much elaboration, just let me point out something here. Look up here. When the trumpets begin, all of the religious leaders of the world are going to begin explaining the trumpets. They will say, these are acts of God. These are judgments from God. We have offended God and we must appease Him. I want, you, I want to say this very clearly. I'm not a prophet, but I'm going to make a prediction. And let's see if it's true. Or it's on tape. So I can't back out. Most people today, including preachers, will not listen to this message. True or false? All right. But when these judgments come, all the preachers on the world of every religious system, of every religious type, are going to stand up and be ready with an explanation of why they're happening. But none of them are willing to investigate the possibility of them happening today. I find that so, so startling. Preachers are, the, are, are almost impossible to discuss this with. But when these events occur, all the preachers of the world are going to stand up and not only explain why they're happening, they're going to offer the solution. And the solution will be to appease God. And they will appeal. The religious, you're going to see a religious revolution during this time period. And, and this revolution is going to produce this world power, this world unity, this world system called Babylon. The name of this beast is Babylon. 
the rising up of this worldwide organization is described in Revelation as the rise and the emergence of Babylon. Confusion. The whole world is in distress and confusion because of the trumpets, and everybody knows why the problem. It's because we have lived wrongfully. We have lived in sin. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. I, you've got to see this. Isaiah saw it. I meant 24, I'm sorry. Isaiah 24. So many things are running through my mind, I can't keep, keep them straight. Behold, verse 1, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken the word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth language, uh, uh, languish. The earth is defiled by what? Its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting what? What is the covenant? If you'll be my people, I will be your God. Therefore, look at verse 6, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are what? burned up. Where is there any fire here to burn up the earth? First trumpet. There'll be plenty of fire to go around. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. Look down at verse 19. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. You see, the ancients believed there was a terrible Loch Ness monster that lived out in the ocean. Back in the days of Isaiah, Isaiah knew about the giant Leviathan. And this great monster, they believed, would come up out of the water and would devour the people if they were too, if they got out of hand too far, if they didn't appease their God. In fact, turn over to Isaiah chapter 27. Look at verse 1. In that day the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent. Leviathan, the coiling serpent, he will slay the monster of the sea. Friends, this is the monster that comes up out of the sea, right here. You're looking at it. This is Babylon. This giant monster of the sea is represented to John in a way that it ties in with things John understood from, from the times in which he lived. And this thing here will persecute the saints and make war against them and conquer them. He will kill many of God's people. There will be a, lots of martyrdom. It will be a horrible time. In fact, over in Job chapter 41, you can read all about Leviathan, how that he has a very strong neck with which to hold many heads. Now, we want to know about these seven heads. That's why we're studying Revelation 17. Look over here at uh, verse 9. Revelation 17, verse 9. The angel tells John 
Now, John, to understand this, this calls for wisdom. Whenever you read that phrase in the Bible, and it is in the Bible several times, it always means there's a little bit of a mystery here, and you've got to sort of be careful till you get it all figured out before all the pieces will come together right. I want to put some things on the board. I want to add up all the things we've learned about the heads. This is the way I study the Bible. Heads. That's what we're studying. We've learned that there are seven. Seven total. We've learned that they are blasphemous. That tells me that they are religious by nature. And in fact, we'll see that more clearly in just a minute. We also know that one of them <clears throat> was wounded. The other six have not been wounded. One, only one of them has been wounded. And this beast, we know, comes up out of, the, out of the whole earth, out of the world, at the time of the remnant. Because Satan has gone off to make war against the remnant, and this is where the war is described. Look down at verse 7, Revelation 13, verse 7. That's where the war is described. Do you see that? He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. That's where the war of Revelation 12, 17 is done in verse 7 of 13. So we already know four things about the timing of this beast. Now, John is told, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills. Well, now somebody told me one day, well, now these seven hills are, those are the seven hills of Rome. This beast, they say, represents the papacy and these heads, the various functions of the papacy. That's not possible. These seven hills, you'll discover, are also seven kings. The city of Rome does not sit on seven kings. In fact, let's get all the details down here. There are seven kings, and we also learn here that uh, five have fallen. I'm going to put that over here. And one is... And one is yet to come. Now, I know I've made a big mess up here, but I think you can get the point. We've got lots of details about the seven heads. And we've got to satisfy all the details before we can come to a conclusion. Is that true? If you want, if you want to come to a conclusion without looking at all the details, well, that's, that's stupid. Seven hills. What does a hill represent that fits in with all of this? Well, turn in your Bible, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's see what a hill meant in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says, During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. What was Israel doing on top of these hills? Worshiping idols, false gods, false and pagan religious systems. Turn over here to Ezekiel chapter 20. Look at verse 28. The Lord is speaking to uh, Ezekiel, and he says, When I brought them into the land I had sworn to give them, and they saw any high hill or any leafy tree, there they offered their sacrifices, made offerings that provoked me to anger. They presented their fragrant incense and poured out their drink offerings. And I said to them, what is this high place you go to? What were they doing on top of the hills? Worshipping idols, worshipping gods, false gods. Turn to Isaiah 65, verse 7. Turn back there to Isaiah 65, verse 7. Let's 
Let's start with verse 6. Let's get, the, let's get the context. See, it stands before me. God is talking about the guilt of his people. I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your fathers, says the Lord, because they burned sacrifices on the mountains and they defied me on the hills. When we have to, after we take our five-minute intermission, I'm going to show you that the hills are seven religious hills, blasphemous religious systems that exist today. Let's take a five-minute break and we'll continue our study. Okay, if you'll take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 9. I want to show you what Daniel thought about a hill. Daniel is praying. He's in captivity. He understands why he's in captivity. He understands why he's in Babylon. And if you look at verse 11, he says to the Lord, All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you. Now, dear friends, I want you to pay close attention to this point. When these trumpets begin, the ministers of all faiths, of all religious systems, are going to stand up before their people and say, I've been telling you about sin. And if you really want to know the truth of it, the larger part of the blame lies to the ministry today. They don't preach about sin. They don't call sin by its right name. We don't ever get down to the real bottom line of Christian growth and development and by calling sin and overcoming sin as we need to be. And the guilt of earth continues to grow and grow and grow and when these events begin to happen, just like Daniel, and I'm sure many are going to read this very verse and say, these things have come upon us because we have refused to obey the Lord. Therefore, let us make laws requiring the obedience to God. And this is where you're going to hear about Friday laws, Saturday laws, and Sunday laws. Friday laws in the Muslim countries. Saturday laws in Israel and Sunday laws in Christian countries. Laws mandating the worship of God to appease Him lest we perish. These laws will be, will be used as a means of controlling people to cause God, to influence God to stop the destruction. But get this. Force is always the last resort of false religion. We're going to force you to be righteous whether you want to or not. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. Now get with it. That's what this beast is. This is a law-making, law-speaking beast. And in each country and each culture that these heads represent, he speaks. And he, the reason that these seven heads are seven kings is because they have subjects. If you're a king, you have a kingdom. If you have a kingdom, you have subjects that obey what you say. Now, if you'll notice down here in verse 16, Daniel prays, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, what? Your holy hill. Look down at verse 20. 
while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for His holy, what? Hill. And while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I'd seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. We have a place in this country that's called Capitol Hill. What does that mean? Does that mean it sits on top of a mountain somewhere? No. If you look in your dictionary, if you have a Webster's Dictionary, and you look up Capitol Hill, you will discover that it refers to the Senate building. And you know why? Do you know what is in the Senate building? <laughs> the very seat of our government. The seat of authority of this country. There is where the laws are made. That's why these are called seven hills. Because it is within each one of these organizations that the laws and the rules, the doctrine is made. Now, who are these seven heads? We know that five, at the time of the vision that John receives this vision, let me go back to my little glove here. There are seven heads. Get those other guys up there a little better. And John is told by the angel that five are fallen. And then the angel says, one is, and one is yet to come. And when this last one comes, the seventh one, it will last for a short time. Seven heads, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. Let me show you how neatly this works out. What year does John have this vision on the Isle of Patmos? It's approximately 100 A.D. And when the angel is talking to John and he tells them that five are fallen, the word fallen here does not mean collapsed. It means five have been exposed as false. When we, when we study the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That doesn't mean Babylon has collapsed. It means that Babylon has been exposed as false. It's been proven and demonstrated to be not true. When we say that Jimmy Baker has fallen, what does that mean? He fell from the public uh, respect. He was, he was shown for what he was doing. He was revealed. The inner, what was going on in secret came out in the open and he fell. Exposed as false. So when five are fallen, we find that five religious systems are fallen in 100 A.D. And the reason that they're fallen is because of the very presence of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to planet Earth as a baby, and he lived for 33 years upon this planet, and then he died on Calvary, he exposed five religious systems as false. Here are the five religious systems. The first and the oldest is atheism. What is atheism? Atheism is the denial of the presence of God. And do you know the great sin of the antediluvians? Those who lived before the flood was atheism. They, de they denied the presence and the knowledge of God, the existence of God. The next religious system is called heathenism. Heathenism has a million different forms. But basically, heathenism is this. Man creates his own God. The goddess of Venus. That's all heathenism. Greek mythology. That's all heathenism. Man making up God. The third oldest religious system 
is Eastern mysticism, mysticism. And this has a million derivatives too. Buddhism, Hinduism, whateverism. Eastern mysticism is false and has been proven false because it says and teaches that man can become God. That's not possible. You cannot achieve God. The next older system is what we today call Islam. Now let me point out here and hasten to add that Mohammed, who organized the nomadic Arabians, lived 600 years after Christ, 500 years after the vision. But Mohammed did not invent a new religion. In fact, if you ask the Muslims today who the father of their religion is, they will tell you that it is Ishmael. The father of Mohammedism is not Mohammed, but Ishmael. Ishmael became a great father of 12 nations, just like Isaac. And today, when you compare the number of Jews there are to the number of Arabs there are, the descendants of Ishmael, you'll discover that there are 20 times as many Arabs as there are Jews, or maybe 40 times. It's a number, an enormous num difference. So what I'm calling Islam is really the nomadic Arabian faith. And, and again, this was exposed as a false religious system when Jesus came to earth because Islam teaches that salvation comes through obedience and not through the works of God. Did you hear that? Salvation comes through obedience and not through the works of God. Where does justification come from? It's the work of God. And the Muslims do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. They recognize him as a good man, a prophet, but he's not the greatest prophet. Mohammed is because Mohammed is the last prophet. There are some modern-day religions that have the same problem. We won't get into that. Now, the last one is Judaism. Judaism existed prior to the birth of Christ. Islam existed prior to the birth of Christ. Eastern mysticism heathenism and atheism, all of these five religious world systems existed prior to the birth of Christ. And when Jesus came, he exposed all five of them as false. And that's why the angel said to John, five are fallen. The birth of Jesus exposed five religious systems as false. And then John is told by the angel, one is, and one is yet to come. The one that existed is what we today call Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church version of Christianity. You see, John was a charter member of the early Christian church. But as time went by, the Christian church went wrong. It lost its opportunity to be to the trustees of the gospel. And in 1798, God finally had to cauterize it and go on with the Protestants. And that, of course, is our last and seventh head, Protestantism. The Bible says that when this head would come, it would last only a short time. Protestantism, as a body, if you will, has only been around for a couple, 300 years. And in terms of world history, back from the creation of the world, 300 years is just a tiny drop in the bucket. These are the seven heads. These are the seven religious systems. This is the one that was wounded. They are, these are seven hills. They are all false. They are all wrong. They all claim to speak for God, and none of them speak for God. They all have subjects. They all have members. And you cannot identify one human being on earth that doesn't belong to one of these seven systems. It's all-inclusive because it's the whole world. 
these are the seven heads. And these seven religious systems will unite together. Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and heathen and atheists and Protestants are all going to unite together to appease God to stop the judgments that are falling upon the earth. Just like Arabs joined with Americans and the Turks joined with the Arabs to stop Iraq in its overtake of Kuwait. You have a good modern example of how it works. You only need circumstances desperate enough to make the union happen. But it will happen. The Bible predicts it. Now, <clears throat> any questions about the heads? Good. Now then, I want to lead you into a very exciting part of this whole story. Because if you will remember, here is the rise of Babylon. And after Babylon gets started, incidentally, let me tell you why it's called Babylon. These seven religious systems are very different. They all claim to speak for God, the same God, the one sending the trumpets. But they all say different things. Now think about the confusion this is going to bring. Seven different religious systems are going to be claiming to speak for God, the God who's sending all the judgments, but they're all saying seven different things. And what are the people of earth going to think? It'll be total confusion. You got that? That's why it's called Babylon. When they built the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, God came down and confused them. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The world will be confused. And you know what? People are so much like sheep. People are so stupid. I don't mean that critically, I mean it honestly. People will follow the leader. Very few people will sit down to study out for themselves what the Bible, what the truth really is. Most people will look to some notable person and follow them. Am I, am I, is that true or false? You know, everybody lifts up and exonerates somebody. Everybody, you know, puts their confidence in somebody else. But the remnant will put their confidence in Jesus Christ and His Word, and they will know why they believe what they believe. That's what separates the wise and the foolish. Babylon rises to power, and the more power it gets, and the greater its authority, and the more laws that it makes, you know, rationing will be implemented. Think about it. The whole infrastructure of life around the whole globe is going to be blown apart. And to, 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 to compensate, the governments are going to implement rationing. And so this is why ultimately there's going to be controls on buying and selling. If you don't go along with the beast, you can't buy or sell eventually. That's how it works. It's very simple. Very simple. These horns are ten kings that when after the sixth trumpet happens down here, Satan will divide the world up into ten kingdoms. And he will divide the kingdom, the world up, and give it to his ten generals who were very instrumental in helping him gain control of the world. That's what's represented right here in Daniel 2 as the ten toes. See how it all fits? I mean, the chronology, everything just ties right together. And uh, John is told by the angel that these ten horns represent ten kings who have not been given a kingdom yet. And dear friends, these ten kings do not represent Europe as the ten tribes or the ten kingdoms of Europe. This is a global event. 
And there's more people on this planet than in Europe. Do you understand? Do you re recognize that this month alone, here we are at the end of May 1991, and we have passed the 5.4 billion people mark this month. Incredible number of people. These ten kings will rule over all of the earth. And the reason the crowns are on these horns, whereas in this earlier view, the crowns were on the heads, is because authority in the days of Jesus was in the religious system. That's why the crowns were up on the heads. Who put Jesus to death? Was it a civil or religious, religious authority that did it? The civil only carried it out. You understand? That's why the crowns, the diadema, the, the rulership is on the heads here. When we get to the very end, guess where the crowns are? They're on the horns because those who will be put to death, those who will be tormented, those who will be put in prison will be there because they have broken the laws, civil laws. You're going to be, if you're faithful to Jesus Christ, you're going to be a lawbreaker. And the penalty for breaking the law will be most severe. And in fact, as time goes by and these judgments continue and circumstances worsen, martial law will be ratcheted down until any violation will bring strict retaliation immediately. It's like what we're seeing right now in Kuwait. What are they doing in the court cases there? They're trying to bring justice, aren't they? They're trying to, to, to deal with those who, who, who turned out to be traitors during the time that Iraq entered the city. Well, my point is, is that these seven heads and ten horns represent a diabolical union of a global church state. And as the, this power grows in intensity and the confusion grows in intensity into the very midst of this, we have the fifth trumpet which is the physical appearing of Satan, and Satan has one main objective, and that is to unite the world, to unite these seven heads, so get them all to saying the same thing. So he's got to convince the Catholics, the Jews, the atheists, the Eastern mystics, the, the Muslims, the Protestants, he's got, and the, and the uh, heathen. He's got to convince all seven religious systems that he's God. And when he comes... His great charade, his great deception is to convince the world that he is God and he will do this by, by performing enormously wonderful miracles. Now, let's see how this is explained in Revelation 13. Look, let's look there at verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Here he comes. He's out of, the, out of the bottomless pit. Looked like a locust. Remember? Revelation 9. Coming up out of the abyss. Now, let me point out something. John says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. I looked in the Greek. That's why I was a little late getting here this evening. Because as I was reviewing this, something just clicked in my mind about something I had heard 20 years ago and I had to go find out and see if it was true. In the Greek, the little article called a, a lamb, a beast, a dragon, the article a is not there. I looked it up and the way it reads is this. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, excuse me, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had, this is what it says in, in, the, in the Greek, and he had horns, too, like lamb, and he spoke as dragon. 
Now, think about this for just a second. Turn to Revelation 5. Look at verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And what does this lamb have? Seven horns and seven eyes. Have you ever seen a lamb with seven horns? No. Seven horns represents the fullness of all power. And as you will see when Jesus comes, his horns, the horns of the lamb, John describes, the reason that Jesus is king of kings is because he has all authority as king of kings. Seven horns, the fullness. Now, all through Revelation, we find the lamb referring to Jesus mentioned 29 or 30 times, depending on the translation of the Bible that you use. The lamb. When the subject is definite and when the noun is definite in the Greek, many Greek uh, texts leave out the articles because what is being said is very clear to the Greek mind. Not the English mind, but the Greek mind. And as, I, and as you read this, I believe it is more correctly stated, and he had horns too like lamb. He had horns too like the lamb had seven. Do you understand what I'm saying? Think about what you're actually reading here in verse 11. Would John describe a beast, a terrible beast coming up out of the abyss and he just describes the two horns and omits the rest of the description of the beast? That would be like going to um, uh, a fair or, or seeing, seeing the Miss America pageant and, and, and your, your daughter runs into the, oh, Dad, she had on the most beautiful shoes. Missed everything else, just saw the shoes. John is not just talking about the horns. He is talking about an imposter, a lamb-like beast, a beast who looks like the lamb but who has only two horns compared to the seven. This is why it's called by some commentators the lamb-like beast, not that the horns are lamb-like. John gives no other description of this beast coming up out of the earth other than it has two horns like lamb, the lamb. If you wish to put the article the in there, the whole meaning gets a little clearer. And I saw this beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like the lamb. Because the lamb had seven. You understand that? Well, watch what happens. I'm going to tell you that this beast here is the physical appearing of Satan and you'll see that in just a minute. He exercises all of the authority of the first beast. All right, this is very complex, so please watch. This is Satan. This is the beast with seven heads and ten horns. I'm sorry, it's the best I can do. Now the reason that I have to draw this out is so that you can follow carefully how this works. He exercised, this, this is the second beast. This is the first beast. Let's make it clear.
The second beast exercises all of the authority of the first beast on his behalf. And he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. Now this beast has seven heads, and one of them had been healed. So John is referring to the fact that this beast makes all the earth worship this beast, and he identifies this beast as the one that had the head that was wounded. If there was a parking lot full of cars out there, and one of them had a big dent in the fender, and you were trying to describe what was out there, you'd say, well, you see that car with the dent in the fender? John is simply saying, you see that beast with the head that was wounded? When, he sa when Satan comes to gain immediate and quick credibility, he comes to the Catholics and he says, you obey the Pope. And he performs wonderful and marvelous miracles to get people to worship the beast. When he, then he travels over and he flies to Israel and Satan appears there and he says, now you worship according to the Torah. You line up with what your religious leaders say. Then he flies to America and he comes here and he says to the Protestant leaders, now you guys obey. Well, who do Protestants obey? Not much of anybody. Well, obey whoever. He flies around and he goes to each one of these systems and he leads the people of each system to worship according to what their religion teaches. He does everything, all of his works, on behalf of each of these heads so that people will see that he is God. Because obviously each person belonging to his religious system thinks that his system is the way to God. Does that make sense to you? The reason that people are Methodists is that they think through, the, through Methodism they get to God. The reason that people are Baptists is they think through Baptist <coughs> theology they get to God. The reason people are Catholics is they think through the church they get to God. So everything that Satan does as he travels around is he does it on behalf of the system. Sounds confusing? Good, good. Verse 13, and he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven and earth in full view of men. To prove his divinity, Satan will call fire down out of the sky. How do you argue with somebody who can call lightning and thunder right before your very eyes. You don't argue with them. Atheists will say over in Moscow, oh, we don't believe in God. We don't think any... Yeah, this is, this is... Somehow or another, you're working this out. I'm not sure, but this isn't for real. Fire comes down and burns off the south end of Moscow. Whoa. We believe in God. What do you want? Most people will be overwhelmed because they have no knowledge of what the Bible says. They have no knowledge of what the truth is. They have no knowledge that the devil is coming in person claiming to be God. And when there is a being here that's more glorious than mortal eye has ever seen, and he's able to do all these marvelous miracles, they're going to say, seeing is believing. True or false? Notice the next verse then, verse 14. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. After he has deceived them long enough, he then orders them. After he has enough followers, after he has enough believers, after he has enough believing that he's God, he orders the earth. And the Greek word there is that he forces the earth to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Let me show you what the image is. You see this? Satan doesn't like this because he wants a one world government. So he's going to say, we want to make a clone of this and we want to create an image. One head Ten horns. We want one world religion. 
This is the image. It's, a, it's the spitting image of this, except rolled up into one. The image is not this. It's the consolidation of this. He says, listen. He says to the Jews, I've changed the day of worship. Who's going to argue with him? You want fire on Jerusalem? No. We believe. He says to the Protestants, he says to the Eastern mystics, he says to the people of the world, I am God. I want an image set up. I want a one world government. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, and one God. I'm it. He will achieve it. In incidentally, the image in Daniel, excuse me, in Revelation 13 is the harlot in Revelation 17. This right here and this woman right here are the same thing. They're described in two different ways so that we can learn more about them. The image rides upon the beast. It directs it, it controls it, it tells it where to go and how to get there. This little guy rides on top of this guy. You see, there will still be Catholics, there will still be Protestants, there will still be uh, all these various religions. Satan doesn't am am amalgamate all the world religions into one world, everybody calling it something different. Oh no, Baptists will still be, still be Baptists, and Pentecostals will still be Pentecostals. But because of the laws that this thing makes, when the image takes over, this is the executive center that controls the world religions system. And the contrast here, the reason in Revelation 17 it's a woman, is because this represents the contrast to this woman. Two women in Revelation story. God's people, the lamb-like beasts people. Both are women, one pure, the other corrupt. And so, after Satan gets his way, and he will get his way, verse 15, he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. In other words, if you do not obey now what the image is saying, you are to be killed. Again, the martyrdom of the fifth seal is clearly seen here. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Let me say something about the mark of the beast. The mark will be literal. It will be visible. It will be either on your right hand or on your forehead. The mark will be necessary in order to conduct business. The reason that it's not a credit card is because people can steal your credit cards. People can use your credit cards. And the devil knows that that's, that's easy to do. But once they tattoo a mark on your hand or on your forehead, you can't exchange that very easily. And if you wish to buy groceries, if you wish to conduct business, you will have to, pro you will have to show the mark. I believe the leadership of Satan's system, those who are officers in Babylon's structure, they will carry the mark in their forehead, representing their high position. Those who are just followers and go along with it, they will receive it in their hand. In fact, do you know that we find right in Scripture, look over here in Exodus 13, verse 9. We find a precedent for this. Look at Exodus 13, verse 9. This is when God took Israel out of the Egyptian slavery, and He told them uh, about keeping the consecration of the firstborn as a perpetual sign 
Look at verse 9. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. This use of the sign on the hand or the forehead was something with which the Egyptians were well acquainted. Look, look again down at verse 16. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. God isn't saying that they're to wear a sign on their hand or their forehead. He's saying that the consecration of the firstborn to the Israelites is to be equivalent to what was done in Egypt. The way people were marked in Egypt. A sign on their hand or, and, or on the forehead. I believe the mark of the beast is the mark of this creature, this beast right here. And the number of his name is 666. I believe the number will be literal. I believe the number will be directly connected to his name. But I cannot yet tell you how that will work. Here's why. When Jesus comes, turn to Revelation 19. When Jesus comes... The Bible says that he will come in verse 12 with a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. Do you see the last sentence there in verse 19, chapter 19, verse 12? Do you see that when Jesus comes, he will have a name that no one but he himself will know? If that name were revealed, guess who would steal it and use it? The devil. So God has not allowed Satan to know what that name is so that when the devil appears, he will take a name. And God has mandated that the name he will take will add up somehow numerically to 666 and this will be one of the clearest and most evident, uh, one of the clearest evidences that the person, this glorious being, performing all these miracles and leading the whole world astray is none less than Lucifer. You've got to be blind to miss this. Everybody on earth knows about 666. And God has ordained that he's going to wear the number because this is the number of the beast, the number of his name. And everybody who worships and who goes along with and who obeys the laws that are instituted as a result of this beast's rise will receive a mark in order to buy or sell. The lamb-like beast is an imposter of the lamb. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory... Everybody on earth will be found worshiping and submitting to one of two. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world or the Lamb-like who has come to destroy the world. Now, there's a lot I could say. There's a lot we could go into. There's a lot we could discuss about these two beasts and so forth. But I want to just leave it with this tonight. In Revelation's story, there are only two beasts. Only two. One comes up out of the water, having seven heads and ten horns, and the other comes up out of the earth or out of the bottomless pit. This is the great glove. This is the great dragon. They will work together for one purpose, to destroy God's people. And according to Revelation, he's going to win. He will conquer the saints. And the saints will have no power. Many will perish. And that's why in Revelation 13, 10, the Bible says, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he's going. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. 
This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Dear friends, if God has determined that you're to, be, to, that you're to go to prison for, for your faith, go with your head up. Go with your confidence strong in the Lord, but go, be firm. If God has determined that you are to be killed with the sword, be faithful to the end. Stand firm, for there's a crown of righteousness awaiting all who shall stand or who shall die for Jesus' sake. This is why the Bible says this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And dear folks, if we're not learning now to live by faith, if we're not learning now how to trust in Jesus with all our life, how shall we stand the time that's coming? The devil has carefully set the stage. He's been preparing for 200 years for this war on the saints, and God is about to let him loose in the opening of the fourth seal. May God help us to be strong. Let's stand for the benediction. Our Father, which art in heaven, we're so thankful for your blessings, for your mercies, and for your goodness. And as we've studied tonight, O oh God, help us to be firm to the very end. Help us to stand for what is right and for what is true. Help us to do the things you'd have us do and to be what you'd have us be and to go wherever you would have us go. Thank you for loving us and caring for us as you have. And someday when you come in the clouds of glory, may we hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you Saturday afternoon. Plan to be here about 3 o'clock. We've got a nice surprise for you to show you. So be here about 3 o'clock.